Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to week three of our Challenge in Apartheid during Advent webinar series. I'll just give everyone a few seconds. I can see there are still people uh, coming into the waiting room. Let me see. I think this is the first week that we've not um, been running at the same time as a World Cup football match. So we're hopeful, we're hopeful that we might have a few more attendees. But we'll, we'll see. <laughs> um, just while we're waiting for a few people to join, um, we were aware that last week and the week before, we didn't actually say too much about Sabil Kairos as an organisation. Um, now for most of you, I think you probably are aware, I think most of you are members of Sabil Kairos, but I do know that there are some people who have joined us specifically just for the webinar. So for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Sabil Kairos UK is a small Christian human rights charity and we advocate for a just peace and equal rights in Palestine and Israel. Um, if anyone wants to know more about who we are and what we do, then obviously you can contact us out with out with the webinars. Okay, so I think that's us just about ready. Um, just some general housekeeping, the same as last week and the week before, if you please keep yourself muted. Um, if you accidentally unmute yourself, uh, one of us will um, mute you again, don't take it personal, <laughs> it's just so that we don't, <laughs> we don't end up uh, with noise uh, over the top of the speakers. Um, and I'll say this again later, but with regards to the Q&A, when our speakers are delivering their talks, if you think of a question straight away, you might want to pop it in the chat um, or you can wait until the end when both speakers are finished um, and I'll introduce the Q&A and you can use the raise hand function. Um, but I'll mention that again, that again later on, so, so don't worry if you forget. Um, so our theme for this week is militarisation and apartheid. apartheid. Uh, I'm actually really interested um, in this topic. Um, so I'm really keen to hear what both our speakers say uh, on this matter. Um, we'll have two speakers tonight. Our first speaker is going to be uh, Don Wagner and our second speaker will be Jack Munayer. Um, I will introduce Don, he's going to go first. Um, and I did actually mention this uh, when we were waiting for all of you to join, but um, I have a little bit of... Um, I don't know what it's like when you meet a celebrity, what you would call that, but I referenced Don's work <laughs> and uh, my dissertation for my master's. So uh, it's quite cool to be introducing him to speak tonight. <laughs> so um, with that, um, Don grew up in a loving evangelical family um, with a conservative religious and political orientation, which was radically changed during the mid 1960s while he was studying at Princeton Theological Seminary. His involvement in the anti-Vietnam protests, the civil rights movement and liberation theology changed his Christian vocational direction, leading to full-time work on Palestinian rights as national director of the Palestine Human Rights Campaign. From 1995 to 2010, he was a professor of Middle East Studies and director of its Middle East Centre at North Park University in Chicago. He served as the National Programme Director for Friends of Seville North America until retiring in 2017. He has written books and numerous articles on Palestinian rights, Christian Zionism and Palestinian history and politics. Most recently, a memoir titled Glory to God in the Lowest Journeys to an Unholy Land. He lives in the Chicago area with his wife, Linda Khatib, where they continue their commitment to justice in Palestine while enjoying their family of three grown children and six grandchildren. So, um, Don, I'll hand over to you whenever you're ready. Okay, B. Well, thank you for that generous introduction. And uh, it's really great to be with all of you in this. And I applaud you for having this Advent series. Uh, I must make condolences for... England's loss yesterday. I was there cheering from here. But uh, now let's move on to some more vital issues, perhaps. And uh, my, my wife is going to screen share. I'll just give you briefly the outline I'm going to pursue. And we lost it. Well, maybe I'll just tell you what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on the political dimensions of the militarization, and I'm calling it militarized apartheid and ethnic cleansing. 
And I make note that uh, yesterday was International Human Rights Day when we honor the signing of the International Declaration of Human Rights, which is largely ignored now. So um, for my introduction, uh, we'll just forget the uh, screen share. Um, I'll talk first about uh, the militarization of the conflict. The Nakba continues every day for Palestinians. We note that nine Palestinians have been killed in the first 10 days of December. This amounts to 177 Palestinians killed in the West Bank, 51 in Gaza. Of the 218 total, which is unofficial, 41 are children. I note Israel controls through various military and other mechanisms, the land of Palestine, the airspace, the resources, all that's under the land, and the people. So this is a complete, intensive, expansive militarization of the conflict. And note there's been a consistent militarization uh, since Herzl's vision of 1897, always supported by Christian Zionists from the beginning, which had both a, no, for, forget, yeah, forget the screen share. Uh, uh, so this is nothing new, but now we're in a period where it's uh, virtually apartheid and militarization on steroids with a new government that's come in. And we saw a foreshadowing of it over this past year. So my first point is Israel has immunity, thanks to the United States. They have immunity from the United Nations with the US vetoing well over 45 resolutions condemning some aspect of the militarization and the apartheid. We yet have yet to see what the International Court of Justice will do. The closure of six international and local human rights, highly respected human rights organizations, all point to the immunity. And as long as the U.S. continues, uh, what is a minimum of 3.8 billion a year, even last year under Biden, it added a billion, uh, Israel will continue this immunity. So I think that needs to be said at the outset. And there's no credible intervention at this point. This is a conflict that needs an intervention and there's no body capable of doing that. In fact, I think it's time to really call for uh, an international protective force for the Palestinian people, uh, given the situation the Palestinians are facing. Now, my second point, and this would take a book. Um, how does Israel, through its military and other mechanisms, control Palestinians? First, the various IDF units from the Golani brigades, the border, the border police, military intelligence are used to terrorize, control, and maintain what Israel calls order. Second, the Israeli settlers are now militarized, the squatters, all illegally present in the West Bank and East Jerusalem on Palestinian land. And now with the two MKs coming from the Kahana movement, uh, probably Netanyahu appointing them to be in charge of both the military and the defense forces, we can expect an escalation. Next, the airspace. Israel bombs Gaza with impunity. The daily drones terrorize an entire population. Now they're becoming more popular in the West Bank. And we note that there are drones now that can fly inside houses, surveil and even weaponize drones. The surveillance systems next. These are very sophisticated, and thanks to HP, Palestinian uh, uh, ID cards, 
have a chip which display all of their violations, but also tremendous information about them and can be used at any point to arrest or turn them back from the checkpoints. When I was in Gaza with my wife and a few people, uh, I'm sorry, not Gaza, but Hebron, very similar, um, we noted someone, our guide pointed out a new uh, camera that had just put up, been put up uh, as you exit um, Shuhada Street that is a uh, facial recognition camera, which will also increase the acceleration of the data and uh, what Israel has, and we will be seeing more of these. So the sophisticated surveillance systems, this is another form of control. The extensive prison system, which I need not say too much about, but the intimidation that that is able to bring. So what all this leads to is a shrinking space for Palestinians to survive in, mostly around the major cities, the population areas, surrounded by military, surrounded by the surveillance and the uh, military systems. And unlike the first intifada, when you could have a mass uprising, Palestinians are forced into these tightly controlled zones. So resistance will be challenged. Nevertheless, it does continue. Another form of the militarization is the collaborator networks. Both Palestinian, Druze, and Israeli paid collaborators have always been used uh, by the Zionist movement and the state of Israel to contain feed information and control the population. And now the Palestinian Authority is playing some of that collaborator role. I just cite the case of Shadi Khuri. You, re you remember the 16-year-old uh, student at the uh, friend school in Ramallah who was uh, picked up, uh, beaten up in his home, and then imprisoned for uh, several weeks. The Palestinian Authority picked him up a month before that and tried to get information from him. So you see the coordination even with uh, the children. Next is the settler colonization. How the settlements, the roads, the infrastructure, the surveillance systems, and the militarized settlers all are fulfilling the vision of a land of no people, the settler colonial vision that really was there from the beginning with Herzl. So finally, I'd wrap this section up by drawing from uh, the political scientist, Dr. Norman Finkelstein, who says this has been an ongoing cycle of first encirclement. The Palestinian populations are driven into a shrinking space and encircled. And you see that all throughout the West Bank and beyond. Second, expulsion. Since 1936 to 39, uh, when there was a revolt and most of the Palestinian leadership of that revolt were expelled to the Cyclees Islands by the British, uh, the Israelis continue to use expulsion. And now you have members of the Knesset uh, who openly call for the expulsion. Thirdly, enslavement. Israel will always need a small workforce to work at a pittance to maintain both building the settlements, but also inside Israel, inside the Green Line. So there is that enslavement, but it is just that enslavement. And then finally, we've seen some of this recently, but we will see it perhaps under this new more fascist Zionist regime, extermination. The actual expulsion, murder, and death. And of course, from the Nakba, this has continued, the extermination dimension. And that is a continuing cycle, encirclement, expulsion, enslavement, and extermination. Now, as a Christian, I can't just leave it at that. I wanna make just a few theological points, and I think 
Jack is going to amplify and do much better. Uh, but I think we need to, before I say that, remember the context here. The Palestinians really have no regular army, limited weapons. They have no air force, no navy, and they're virtually unable to protect themselves. And even their elected government and unelected uh, are not really providing security. Their opponent is the strongest military force in the Middle East, and it is a nuclear power, possibly the fourth strongest in the world. What the Palestinians do have is the moral side of the argument. And we've seen a hint of that at the World Cup. Uh, and this has been very encouraging. But this has to be amplified, and this is where we come in, in solidarity as supporters. So my first theological point is, in Advent, we are on a darkened stage as Advent begins, in absolute darkness with a very faint light down the road. But then we know there is hope with that light. And the darkness will never conquer and overwhelm the light. And as a Christian, um, we are grounded in hope, not optimism. Optimistically, this is a grim defeatist position that the Palestinians face. But in hope, we actually have signs and we trust in the Lord of Lords that Jesus is Lord. And in the end, this imperial rule will collapse. And we read uh, Revelation much differently than the Christian Zionists with their end time scenario. We draw from the New Jerusalem, lamb power, the victory of the lamb, which is a victory over not over the Roman Empire, but every empire. So empires will not last. In fact, perhaps we are seeing the gradual death of Zionism and this empire, but the last gasps will be vicious. So thirdly, in this interim period, before the fulfillment and the end of the empires and the victory of the lamb, the darkness and the militarization call us to take a stand of solidarity with the Palestinians. They have no choice but to resist. Even to get up in the morning and go to school and go to work is a form of resistance. And this is where we must stand beside them. And our call is Matthew 25. Where were you when I was in prison? Did you visit me? When I was thirsty, did you give me something to drink? When they demolished my home, were you there standing with me? And will you help me now? Even though these things happen, Jesus is there. That is the reality. That is where we find Jesus today with the marginalized and the brutalized. So resistance continues. And I always take hope with uh, Luke 18, Jesus' parable of the widow, who is really quite powerless. But that widow, whatever the grievance was, pestered that judge relentlessly. And the key to that passage was she wore him down. She went every day and wore him down. Samud, this is now what we're called to do. And this is why I titled my memoir uh, of what I've learned from the Palestinians, Glory to God in the Lowest. A little twist on the Annunciation to the Angels. But this is Jesus' ministry. This is Matthew 25. To be there with a costly solidarity and love with our Palestinian people. Trusting in the hope of Jesus, but also that Jesus is Lord even over all the empires, and they too will vanish. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don. That was 
it was very powerful um, and I actually found it quite moving as well so um, thank you um try not to cry <laughs> um just before we we move on to um introduce our next speaker just to draw a couple of points from what Dawn said that's maybe helpful to keep in mind because sometimes I I felt when I was listening you know that when he was mentioning things about you know the ongoing Nakba for Palestinians and, and the way that Israel um has these various ways of maintaining militarized control you can sometimes feel lost and you can sometimes feel with an empire like this you know what what can we do and, and where you know where do we fit in um, but I think what Don said there was first of all through you know our Christian faith and our Christian beliefs and also um, through solidarity um, and standing with Palestinian people so I, I found it really helpful there Don the way that although it was quite Oh, at the beginning, you managed to bring us back at the end to, to a positive a positive outcome. So thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is Jack Munayer. Jack was born and raised in Jerusalem to a British mother and a Palestinian Christian citizen of Israel father. Jack completed his BA in Sociology and Criminology from the University of York and an MA in Human Rights and Transnational Justice from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Jack currently manages the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Accompaniment Program in Palestine and Israel, which some of you might know as EAPPI or EAPI. Um, and Jack's main line of work has been focusing on human rights and humanitarian assistance. And I'll pass over to you now, Jack, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and good evening, everyone. It's great to be with you uh, during this period of time and to talk about this very important subject. Um, I've been asked to talk about militaris militarism and something that wasn't mentioned in my bio that I think is important to mention is that I, I grew up in an Israeli Jewish school and I was the only Palestinian uh, in my year. And that gave me a very unique insight into how much militarism is a part of Israeli education and society. And when we talk about militarism, uh, militarism is basically the view that a strong military is uh, an effective tool or perhaps the most effective tool in achieving some type of national goal. And in Israeli society, it's even a step further. It's part of one's identity uh, for most of Israeli society. And so when, when I went to study uh, in at York uh, in England, I was shocked to see how in, in English schools or British schools, you prepare students or you try to prepare students to pursue a higher education in university. You get tours of universities, you get all sorts of lectures on what it's like to be a student. But here in the Israeli Jewish system, the one that I studied in, you are prepared to go to, to, to the army. And so when I was 16, everybody in my year received their military summons we start to get divided up into who goes into which unit. And I was the only one in my year that didn't receive that summons. And I was, and I really got to see the sort of identity switch that many uh, Israeli Jewish students have to do in order to prepare uh, to be in the army. And the military even sent a soldier to accompany us in the classroom in order to try and encourage people to pursue more uh, combative uh, units, uh, in order to, tr to make sure that everyone is doing their best to get into um, the highest units in the army that they could. And so militarism in Israeli society, I think one Israeli has put this very well, is like a second bar mitzvah. It's, al it's almost like a second coming of age process that every Israeli Jewish citizen has to go through. And so well, as, as we talk about militarism, I think it's very important to keep that in mind because it's not just the military that becomes part of the identity of many, it's the occupation itself. And, he, and many soldiers might not be able to articulate that, might not completely understand that, but the occupation becomes part of one's identity. So that's the first thing that I want us to keep in mind when we're talking about militarism in this context. The second thing, and I think Don's covered uh, a lot of how militarism expresses itself from a political and a 
sort of, um, let's call it a meta or a macro perspective when it comes to the conflict. But I want to talk a little bit about how it affects uh, some of the everyday life from a very legal perspective. Because when you look at a military occupation, if you look at international humanitarian law, which is basic, basically the fourth Geneva Convention, there are a lot of requirements on a military if they are to occupy uh, another land and another people. And it's very intentionally put that way. It's meant to be a deterrent so that you, you know, if you are going to occupy someone, you have to make sure that they have access to education. You have to make sure that they have, have access to health and all this long list of requirements. But inside the Fourth Geneva Convention is another perhaps twist in how to understand uh, a military occupation. What I mean by this is, let, let, let's pause for a minute and think. Why would you want to have a prolonged military occupation? You are exposed to incredible, or you're meant to be exposed to incredible international scrutiny, legally, media, politically. And there are many restrictions that are put on you when you have to manage a military occupation. There's a high economic cost. There's a security cost to it. So why maintain a military occupation? I, I want to expand, uh, Don has covered some of these, but I want to expand on some of the benefits of having a military occupation and perhaps maybe one of the only reasons that Israel has decided to maintain this system and not some other alternative system. And that is that in a, in a military occupation, you also receive all sorts of uh, clauses or perhaps powers where you can infringe on one's rights. So let's, let's go over a very, very quick example. So one that most of you will be familiar with is an administrative detention. When someone is detained as a preventative measure without having co committed any crime, without having done anything, but is detained in order to try and keep public security. And this is actually in the Fourth Geneva Convention under Article 78. It states that decisions regarding such assigned residence or internment shall be made according to a regular procedure to be prescribed by the occupying power. It shall be subject to periodical review, if possible, every six months. This is the same law that the British used in Northern Ireland to administratively detain uh, people there. And it is the same law that's used today in the West Bank, specifically, not in Israel. There's a different type of law when it comes in Israel. And so you see here that you have the right, essentially, to detain someone for up to six months as an occupying power. And those laws are prescribed by the military. So under a military occupation, you are given a lot of freedom to uh, infringe on the rights of the people that you're meant to being uh, protecting even. Uh, under this system. So for example, inside the West Bank, the IDF uh, or the security forces military commander or other commanders have the authority to detain someone under the interest of public security. That, that detainee must be brought before a military court in the West Bank within eight days and a military judge will decide on a detainment of up to six months. Now that can be extended indefinitely as long as the commander believes that the detainee still poses a risk uh, to public security. So here you can see that having militarism as part of, as the one that's leading your legal system actually provides you with all sorts of opportunities or uh, it can be used for your benefit. Another one that might be used is uh, that of a closed military zone. So the army has the ability to declare an area a closed military zone, even if that area might be someone's house or someone's garden or someone's field if they're shepherds. And so here you have the ability to move and remove people with great ease when it comes to uh, the military law. Now, 
I want to give you an example of a specific community to see how it affects people's daily lives. This is the community of Nabi Samuel, and I'm going to put the text in the chat um, about uh, this community, so those of you that want to read it can follow with me. But essentially, this is a Palestinian community that are West Bank ID holders, but are on the wrong side of the wall, as it were. So as we know, the wall doesn't follow on the green line. And so this community essentially has been put on the Israeli side of the wall, or the Israeli proper side of the wall, even though they have West Bank IDs. So I'll just read through this text very quickly uh, and try and get it in the chat. All right, it's not pasting for me, so I'll just, I'll just read it. So the Israeli military keeps a list of villagers to sift through when they enter and exit through a military checkpoint at the village entrance. To be on this list, the villagers must obtain special permits, which must be periodically renewed by the Israeli security authorities. The private cars of residents, including those with West Bank license plates, are also registered at the checkpoint. Residents of Nabi Samuel must receive coordination from the Israeli civil administration to receive any visitors, whether they're family members um, or, or friends. If they want to bring goods to their village that are deemed as commercial or large furniture, they must receive permission from the Israeli civil administration beforehand. The process entails first calling the village council, on the same day that you are going to transport any goods. The village council then must call the Israeli border police office in a settlement. Then the Israeli border police office must call Israeli forces at the Al Jeep checkpoint. And the period of time that that can take can last for hours until you get the, the right answer. And you are only given between one or two hours to actually cross the checkpoint. Even if you have managed to receive all the, the yeses that you need, the cord when it comes to coordination, the discretion of the soldier at the checkpoint is the ultimate decider of whether you get to cross on that day or not. And Nabi Samuel residents cannot enter Jerusalem without permits, as most residents are West Bank ID holders. A large Israeli security tower monitors the movements of people and those found in Jerusalem without a permit will receive a fine or will be detained. These permits are virtually impossible for young people to receive between the age of 22 and 30. Residents may lose entry rights to their village by having their names removed from the checkpoint list if they decide to live anywhere else. They would then only be allowed to visit after coordinating again with the Israeli civil administration. So due to the difficulty of obtaining permit, permits and residents visiting, most of the community organizes its life cycle events and community events outside of the village. So again, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm listing this is because here you have the multiple layers of how militarism affects Palestinians in their everyday life. You have this complicated, bureaucratic, administrative system in which you need to get all sorts of permissions just to go shopping or just to have a cousin visit you or to have an aunt or any relative. But at the same time, you have also the randomness and the abuse of power by a soldier on the day at that location, if you, even if you do receive all the right permits. And so that I think really displays both faces of what militarism looks like. It's one that's incredibly bureaucratically, bureaucratically restrictive and one that's very unpredictable. At the same time, even with all these restrictions, you also have a military watchtower, which is constantly watching the community. And so this aspect of restricting one's lives really permeates every aspect and every moment of what the community has to face. Now, there are thousands of examples like this. And for each Palestinian community, there might be slightly different versions of this. But the point is, 
that the decision by the Israeli government to use militarism not only as a main tool but as a main source of identity is always on the expense of the rights of the Palestinians. So I'll, I'll pause here uh, and I'm, uh, hopefully be able to answer um, uh, different questions that come in. And as I do that, I will also try and get the text in the chat uh, while I do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. Um, that was very informative. Um, I really enjoyed listening to you. Um, I think a really useful point that you made that sort of sums it all up is the fact that you know, militarization ultimately is, is an abuse of power. And that's what we're seeing um, in, ten, in a militarized Israeli society at, at the expense of Palestinians. Um, and thank you for taking the time to, to share that with us. Um, in a second, we 